So she, um, Julia is actually someone whom I greatly admire, and I noticed that she finished her presentation and transitioned quickly to my introduction. So can we give her a round of applause for a great presentation, please? <laughs> I am a big, big, big fan of what she's done. It's very, very inspiring, and it shows us that anybody with an idea can bring something to life to change the way that we work or the way that we play. And that is really what this is all about, because you're not just event planners, you're not just event organizers, you are, as David said earlier, the creator of experiences. And that is a big responsibility, it's a wonderful responsibility. And I'm a speaker, I'm an author, and I can tell you that it's been fascinating watching just how fast things have changed. I used to go into the green room a few years ago and watch other speakers get really upset and complain out loud and curse and scream about how upset they were that the audience wasn't paying attention or making eye contact with them, that they were always looking at their phones. And I would just laugh, like, oh man, I guess that means you're gonna have to be tweetable as a speaker moving forward. I guess you're gonna have to stop using 16,000 bullet points on your slides <laughs> and change the way you present. And that was sort of a physical symbol of how people were struggling with change. You either change how you present or you suffer the consequences. And it's kind of dire and it kind of sucks, but at the same time, it makes us better. It made me as a presenter rethink, what's the purpose of a PowerPoint, right? Because nothing says social media like PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me rethink how I talk, what I put on a slide, could I, could I get a point across in 140 characters? It made me a better storyteller. It made me, fortunately or unfortunately, speak in sound bites. I hope I don't do that in the real world. But the point is, is that it made me as an individual change. And we all have to think as planners and organizers or as experienced architects, what that could look like. So as Julia shared, essentially the millennial generation and say some of the older generations like me, uh, there's just a bit of a difference in how we go through our days. GE is a company we all know and love, I'm sure, but one of the things that they do that I think, I think is very interesting and something for you to consider, it's called reverse mentoring. And I just thought of that as I was listening to Julia talk one of the things that's most fascinating about millennial study, because I do millennial and Generation Z research, the one thing I've learned is that what I would do and what they would do are different. It's completely counterintuitive. I would never have thought of it. And therefore, because I can't think of how to engage that naturally, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm right. It means that I have a lot of work to do. And so what GE does is they bring millennials together with decision makers or executives or stakeholders, and they have to work together for a week, and they have to live a day in the life of on both sides so that you create mutual understanding and empathy. And once you get it, I call it the undercover boss moment. Anybody here watch the show Undercover Boss? Yeah, I watch it even though it has the same ending every episode. <laughs> <laughs> and there is this moment in the show where the executive gets it, right? And they'll usually say something like, I forgot what it was like to be a customer. I forgot what it was like to be a human being. That's the moment where they get empathy. It's a gift. And that's that moment we all need to better appreciate how this crazy world is evolving so that we don't just react to it, but that we can help steer and shape it and then create experiences that matter for everybody. I mean, I'll tell you, I'm blown away by every day how something is different. I, I was up last night, you know, thinking all intellectual, like watching Sharknado 2. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking about, well, what am I gonna talk about today? And just as I did, I, I, a news story came across my, my email box. Did you see this? There's stories breaking everywhere that the new selfie is the ussy. And I thought, what? <laughs> What is that all about? And the fact that it was even news was fascinating, but it essentially was, what do you call a selfie when it's more than one person? It's right, it's breaking news. <laughs> Believe it or not, I always thought it was called a groupie. I thought that was cute. 
but it's an ussy, and that led to all kinds of debates because I had to stop what I was doing and write about it, and people started reacting. I hate that term, I love that term, but whatever. The point is, is that it's changing, and I, I see the look in everyone's eyes. Yes, I'll get to the PowerPoint. I know how anxious <laughs> you are for this. But before I do, please start thinking about your questions. I, I had a, 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 an experience recently at South by Southwest in Las Vegas. Gosh, time is flying. I think it was this month uh, where I got to interact with this, the, uh, the question platform that I think is pretty fascinating. So let's jump into this. Come up with some really interesting questions. I'll be here throughout the day, too, if, you, if we don't get to your questions. Uh, as a participant in trade shows, I don't know if anybody in this room remembers Comdex. I used to have to go to Comdex every year, twice a year. Um, and it always looked the same. And it was a technology conference. It always blew me away that everything was the same. No, there was real little innovation in terms of the experience when you were there. This slide is particularly important to me because I, I can't tell you how many times I've watched people nod off while I'm talking and I try to hold my composure. It just doesn't work. It's like, what's his number? Let me text him. Wake up. But that, as an organizer, is something that you have to start to think about. Right? I'll, I'll just share a quick tidbit with you. I organize a conference in New York every year called the Pivot Conference. And I'm completely empathetic with the world in which you live. It is one of the greatest challenges to bring to life what it is that I'm talking about. And one of the first things that I did was ask all speakers to not use slides, or if they did, to make it fascinating. And no one was allowed to talk more than 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Uh, that's because we had a lot of things to cover. But more so, because I wanted to challenge the speakers to go through the same experience I had to be engaging to an audience where we won't say our attention span is thin, we'll just say it's focused on what's important to us, because I'm a hopeless optimist. But I can't tell you how many people pushed back. And so I had to, over the years, be very particular about who we would allow to take the stage. And even still, I would get on the phone, very Steve Jobs-like, to control the experience, and kind of lay down the law and be completely unapologetic. So by the way, when 15 minutes comes up, I'm turning the music on, whether you're done or not. So it's up to you to think about how you're going to use your time. I can't tell you how many times I had to put the music on. <laughs> Still. But as David alluded to earlier, I mean, there was a time where we asked you to turn your phones off. There was a time where we wouldn't provide Wi-Fi. And there was a time where we just actually wanted you to make eye contact with people on stage. I'm actually better off if I just see your foreheads lit up, because then that means, means that we're sharing the experience. So if everything is changing, right, we have a decision. We either let change happen to us, or we actually become the reason for change. And that's what I'd like you to think about as you experience this event today. And also, think about it as you go back to your office. All of this stuff is not anything new. So what does that mean? What does an experience mean? It's more than a prop. It's more than creating opportunities to get other people to miss out. It's about actually building a community of people who have like-minded aspirations, like-minded challenges, and solving and ideating and innovating together here and sharing those moments with others because they're important to us because they touch us here and then also staying connected afterwards right it's the marriage of digital and the real world and those experiences by trying to design them trying to design those moments for people to connect and learn and share you build friendships and relationships, and relationships equal word of mouth, and word of mouth equals community. So let's kind of talk about a day in the life of, so we can reverse engineer what experience could look like in a connected society when we don't necessarily live the connected society as it's evolving, right? I, I'm an analyst. I have to talk to executives all the time who don't get it. 
And one of the things that I'll hear all the time is, well, hey, Brian, thanks for your ideas. That sounds like a really innovative approach. We can't do them, however, because no one's done it before. Cool. All right. So you can compete for second place. It's no law. I mean, that's just a horrible excuse. I, I tell you, every time I, I write a new book or a research report, I'll get critics all the time. Well, you know, Brian, the book would have been better if you just gave us case studies and best practices and the top 10 ways to do all of these things. And I'll say, you know, if I would have found businesses that actually were doing amazing things because they were actually trying to do amazing things and they were successfully changing and all of that stuff, I would tell you. But we're all trying to figure this out. And a lot of companies put on a good show, a lot of people talk a good game, but the future is unwritten. How many people have seen the Back to the Future movie series? I don't, okay, well, I'm surprised that's not everybody. I don't believe some of you. <laughs> For all those geeks in the audience that remember the DeLorean time panel, maybe you can image Google this later. The future is next year. 2015. Crazy. <laughs> and when you look at what, how they describe the future, <laughs> it looks nothing like today, really. It really doesn't. There are no hoverboards, unfortunately. But what was clear is that if they couldn't get it right, that means that nobody's really getting it right. It means that it's our time to basically write the future today. You have to be the case study that people follow. You have to be the person that understands the technology is going to keep changing and that simply trying to bring it in isn't good enough. Once you start to think about the human elements of experiences, you then start to use technology as an enabler. Right? It has a purpose to do something, not just to do it because that's what everybody's doing. Because attention is something that is finite, right? It's focused, and it happens in bursts. And you have to design your program, your real world experience, your workshops, your seating, everything around captivating people's attention. Can't take anything for granted today. Because most of the time, we go through life looking at our screen. It's not anything new, too, because I'm sure you've seen those pictures circulating the web where they'll show people on a subway reading a newspaper, they'll show people on trains reading newspapers and say, well, we've always been zombies. Well, cool. But what's on the screen? And that's where experience architecture begins. The screen is either somebody tweeting the moment or somebody talking to someone else because the moment is not interesting. But experience architecture is the relationship between what we see and feel and sense and what passes through that screen. Think of the screen as a window. And what you want to help people put through that window and share is experience architecture. And it's wonderful. I've heard about today's lunch. I'm pretty sure that's going to trend not just on Twitter but on Instagram. And I'm very jealous. So save me a box, please, David. When I first heard this stat, I was blown away. I said, wow, this world is going crazy, because I'm a parent. I have a 17-year-old, and it's pretty accurate. <laughs> it's about how long someone can focus before reaching for a tech distraction, which is usually the phone. And then I started to think about it. Six minutes is a long time, right? So if you have six-minute bursts, how would you change your event strategy to capture attention in those bursts? How would you write differently to engage people in a way that they're being conditioned to read information, right? How many people have seen this story a thousand times a day, right? <laughs> the wet one just drives me, that's just so funny. <laughs> and so this, I share this with you because it's funny, and then two, because Think about this. We all have to compete for attention. What's the role of a website today? You have attention for a few minutes. 
you need to learn about something that's specific to you, you're probably going to use your smartphone. You're going to have to present information a lot faster, a lot differently, a lot more visually, right? Hey, Brian, send us a paragraph of what your speech is going to be about. A paragraph? Really? You think someone's going to read that? Maybe we should make an animated GIF with cats. <laughs> and we can put thought bubbles about what I'll talk about. That, people say, I can't wait to see Brian's speech. Did you see how he used animated cats? It's fantastic. But it all changes based on your vision for what's possible, inspired by an appreciation for just how wacky things are out there, right? And it's not just us. Think about this. The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, these are publications that are rich with journalistic history and integrity, and now they're having to compete against a society that's being conditioned to just take information, absorb it, and share it. The depth, right, we're becoming a little bit more shallow, for better or for worse, I'm not saying that you have to make everything so dumbed down that no one's going to learn anything. I'm just saying that you have to communicate differently, right? I published a research report this past week that was 33 pages long. And then I had to take that research that I designed initially as a 33-page report and then make an infographic out of it and make a video series out of it and make a series of shareable infographics out of it just to retell the story in ways that people can consume, appreciate, and share. So the experience isn't the process of bringing people together or distributing information. The experience is in what you share and why, what connects with you. I call this uh, mediumalism. It's a problem that we all seem to suffer from where we think about the channel more than what we think about what we put in it. We're all probably guilty of that. We have to have a YouTube strategy. We have to have a Pinterest strategy. We need a Twitter strategy. We need an Instagram strategy. But why? What is it? What is the culture of each of those networks? What's fascinating between the people who share and consume in those networks? How would you create information differently specific to the culture of each of those networks. Even if it's the same story, it would be told differently in each of those platforms. That's experience architecture. It's at the beginning. What do you stand for? And how would that sense of purpose, being, meaning, inclusion, come across in all of the things you do? Because I still talk to people who talk about the days of yore when they could go to a concert and be able to look at the artist on stage and not have to look at a sea of screens. Put the phones down, you're in the moment. That's when I have to tell them, you sound like my parents, and their parents, and their parents. In my day, we didn't have phones at a concert. Well, it's cool, it's fantastic, but now you do. <laughs> and if you think about it, if you're the artist, you know this is going to happen. So rock. Make it an experience worth sharing, not just with the 400 people in this room, but the 400,000 people we're probably all connected to, who's connected to, who's connected to. We're an audience of an audience of audiences. So your programming now shouldn't just talk to people. It should talk through people. That's different, right? If I want to share something that's fascinating, Cool. If I want to share something that you're going to share, that's a really different approach. BuzzFeed, for example, is really good at that. There's a lot to learn from those silly headlines and animated cats. It's all science. They have figured out how to not just make you consume something, but to make you share it. And they've monetized that really well, and it's a really different approach. You're activating an audience with an audience of audiences. The conversation that we're having here and the conversations that you spark simply from sharing something fantastic is what community is all about. I'm going to hold that slide because I see that you can take a picture of it. I'm going to share it too. All right, excellent. So I'm holding it for him, guys. <laughs> but the, the real answer is I'll, I'll make sure you all get a copy of the presentation. <laughs> so you, can, you can Instagram it all you want. This is a really fascinating picture. 
just wanted to point that out. <laughs> this is a uh, <laughs> this is a visualization of how we are embracing all of this new technology today, right? <laughs> so I'm old enough to remember what it was like to have to get up from the couch and turn a knob on a television. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. We had these round things on TVs that you could change the channel. That's kind of how that worked. But when the remote control hit, right, it hit in the 50s. It, it became a thing eventually. You know, some of us have them. But think about it this way. How many remote controls do you have in your main room? Right? It's kind of ridiculous. One for the TV, one for the cable box, one for the radio, one for whatever. All these remotes. Just pick one of them up, any one, right? Look at it when you get home. I want you to think about this. That controls a piece of glass. And think about how you interact with this, right? And then look back at that remote and see the world through the eyes of a millennial. The millennial will say, who in their right mind thought that putting 100 buttons on a brick to control that piece of glass <laughs> was the right thing to do? Who led the UX development on that? How did that pass usability studies? It sucks. I tried to watch that Sharknado last night, which I did, but even trying to use the remote control for a TV in my hotel room, oh my gosh, it's like a foreign language. There's no sense of innovation in how to engage. And my point is this. That is not how you use technology. Yet it's become iterative. It is because every time there's something new, we take the legacy way of thinking and put it in the same box. And the future of events, the future of experience architecture is just that. David and I were talking last night about how it's really about user experience. And user experience is one of the most underappreciated disciplines out there. A lot of times UX just gets relegated to website design or mobile design. But if you took what they study and how they look at people and the experience that they want people to have and feel, it would make you think that perhaps our legacy approach could be reinvented. I have, a fee I have this mantra that I live by now where it's question everything. And it's not just because I'm a rebel, because I am. But it is because that is that moment. This is that moment in time where you question everything, right? So for example, when I talk about innovation with executives and I talk about better understanding today's connected society so that we can lead it I don't know what it is, if it's a psychological response, if it's just a way of stalling or a stall tactic, but most executives will say, well, why do I need to do that? Steve Jobs never did market research. And the one that I get all the time is, well, haven't you heard that Henry Ford quote? If I asked customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. So when you question everything, things kind of work differently. First of all, <laughs> I, mean, I don't even know how to reply to the Steve Jobs one. Like, seriously, did you just call yourself Steve Jobs? <laughs> but the Henry Ford one was particularly fascinating to me. I've, I heard that so many times that I decided to research it. Turns out, there is no documented proof that Henry Ford ever said that. <laughs> right? It's just ridiculous. So now I have fun with that one. Really? Well, let me just tell you something. The Henry Ford Museum can't even document it. But what is documented, what he did say is actually in a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It's an old book, actually still rocks today, to be honest with you. And he said, if there's one secret to success, it is to get the perspective of someone else and let it inspire you. Some would argue that's what Steve Jobs did very well. That's what this is about. It's about looking at all of this crazy technology and saying, and I don't expect you to read that, but this is for your homework. What it says is, stop looking at the world 
through the lens of yesterday. Start looking at it for its possibilities based on the experiences, the human experiences you want people to have and share, not just in the moment, but throughout the year. The event is just a physical gathering of people who celebrate where we are and where we need to go together. So how would you keep that celebration moving forward? How would you keep people engaged based around those experiences? Because as a technology analyst, if I sat here and said, well, you know, if you think about all of the technology you're going to need every time you organize an event, we're all going to just bleed through our eyes. And that's not going to be any fun. Because what you see here is this wheel of disruption. And I want to share it with you because, one, I want to blow your mind, and two, just get you to stop thinking about technology first. Everybody's guilty of technology first. Real time and social and mobile are at the heart of all of this innovation today, right? But beyond that, oh, it gets crazier because now there's apps and ephemeral apps where things disappear. And then there's this whole debate of the first screen versus the second screen. And there's, oh my gosh, big data. Have you started studying big data for how to make your events better? And gamification and messaging. And then, oh, wow, there's a maker economy and a sharing economy and wearables are coming and virtual and, whew. Yes. It gets crazier every year, right? There's beacons, there's all kinds of stuff. It's only going to get crazier. And that's okay. This is why you can't think technology first. You have to think experience first. What do you want people to sense? How are you going to activate the senses? How are you going to appeal to somebody, not just intellectually, but emotionally? Because then technology will do a job for you which technology you use becomes clearer. I'm going to fast forward through a lot of slides, but if any event organizers in this room could just plug this in for me and save my battery anxiety, you will have my love and devotion forever. But I'm just going to fly through this as I'm talking because I only have a few minutes left and, you know, slides are slides, right? You can look through this later. But the point of it is there are just so many different things to do. This one's particularly interesting. This is a company called Lightwave. And if you go to a concert, it senses when you start dancing more. It senses your temperature. So it basically is telling the event organizers how you're responding to the content or the experience. And they can change the lighting. They can change the music. They can change all kinds of things to amp you up. It's pretty fascinating and scary at the same time. <laughs> but I'm going to just fast forward to the end because that's where some of the best conversations happen. And at the end, this is really about rethinking the journey, right? Before, during, and after an event. What is the role of a website? What is the role of a landing page? What is the experience you want people to have when they learn about the event on a big screen? And also, how would you recreate, don't port it, don't just redesign it, how would you recreate the experience on a small screen? People have attention deficit disorder or attention deficit in order, however you want to look at it. But all of these moments can be re-engineered to be more substantial today as people are learning or as people are ready to give you their credit card to become a, a member, or simply by how you activate word of mouth. For example, social sends more people to you than a search engine. Yet we still think about Google as the place where we have to put a lot of our money in our search engine optimization and marketing. But what happens when you go to Google as a connected consumer to learn more about events that you might want to attend? You type in some stuff, and websites come back. Well, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, because I'm pretty sure not many would go up. But how many times do you go to Google, get a website back, because, by the way, this is not the second screen. This is the first screen. 
I'd argue that you're on this screen more time every day than you are on a big screen. Websites, when they come back on this, in a word, suck. Because nobody thought about how to make something specific for a six minute attention span, probably less than that, in a world where you want to do this, right? What we're doing for websites today is the equivalent of the remote control for TVs. We're just not innovating. So it starts there. It starts with the experience you want to create. And then this is sort of, <laughs> there's so many pictures I went through when I wanted to share this point with you. Um, this was the one I ended on. Uh, and it's one of the, there's also a, a potty trainer too that has an iPad holder. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely debatable. <laughs> but the point is this, it's, um, it's a thing, it's happening. So we either become skeptical about it, we push back, or we just sort of embrace it. What do we do to capture attention based on how someone's used to going through life, right? It's different, it's this yet we still keep designing for this. The only time you do this on a lot of websites on a mobile phone is that you, so you can blow up the button and hit it with your finger. That's no way to experience any of this. This is about community, and this is about a community where I need you to think differently leaving here. Don't just say, okay, these are all our assets, this is the approach, and all of our processes and systems that we use every time we do an event. That's yesterday. Think about it this way. What if you questioned everything? What if you reinvented for a digital first experience? I can tell you that if you applied UX to a digital first experience, everything benefits, not just what you see online, but what you see in the real world, because it means that you're thoughtful about it, more meaningful, more significant. And that is where you'll see not just an ROI, but also a return on experience, and in the end, that's what this is all about. So with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you.